And uh, as you may have noticed, I didn't mention it in announcements, but also, of course, if you've been here last, if you were here last week, you know, we're not doing a, a greeting anymore where we get up and shake hands just for extra precaution. Of course, we encourage you to kind of visit at a distance as, as we come in and come out, and we were doing that when we entered this morning. Also, we're not taking up the offering and then we're not passing the plate, as that would be the potential to touch the plate and pass burdens, you know, I understand. So, um, so the plates are up here at the front and at the back uh, on the tables. And if you uh, are led to uh, contribute this morning, we appreciate that. We appreciate everyone who supported us during uh, the shutdown and those who found a way to either mail or to drop by and, and, and give their um, offering or tithe. And that really went a long ways to supporting the needs of this church and, and helping us really come out of the winter after a winter full of heating oil bills. And I know we had some groups, and you know, I'm so thankful for how the Lord's timing worked out because ultimately God is in control. And you know, the pandemic could have started a month earlier, right? Or two months earlier, and it would have hurt us a lot more because we had groups that used the gym. Um, and, 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 and we appreciate that uh, being able to use it for that purpose and, and some of the support that came in for that purpose. And, um, between that and all the faithfulness of those of you who have been watching on Zoom, those of you who are now here today, and uh, really supporting the ministry here and also of our missionaries. And uh, we look forward to seeing a couple of those our, our missionaries in just a few weeks now. But this morning, I'm going to ask you to turn with me to the book of 1 John, chapter 4. And... You know, in uh, these times in which we are living today, we are facing challenges, controversies that we've uh, seldom seen in our history. You know, we've seen similar events, but just it, it, it seems all the more challenging today as uh, never seen before. And, you know, we really need God's Spirit um, enabling us to face these challenges. I mean, how do we um, discern between what is right, what is wrong, between what is true, and what is untrue? When we're making you know, decisions, do we go to church, do we stay home? You know, things like that. And who do we vote for in the fall? Things such as that. How do we discern between what is true and what is false? How do we how do we, when we feel like the world is opposed to what we believe and where we stand, and even the, the, our ability to freely assemble, how do we overcome the world? And when the world around us today is full of fear and even hatred, and we've seen that evidence, of course, this this last week in, in, in Minneapolis, I was uh, appalled to hear about that. That's happened, of course, in other cities, including Baltimore, in the last two years. And, and it's very disappointing every time you've seen that kind of behavior that was seen uh, on, on, on all sides there. I mean, uh, uh, think, speaking of, of something that the police did wrong and then the reaction toward it, which was also very, very wrong. And we need to pray for our country. More than ever before, it would seem, and we, I believe God still can and may bring a revival if we submit to his spirit, because the, the Holy Spirit, God's spirit, gives us that ability to discern between truth and error. He gives us the ability to overcome the world, and he gives us the answer to the fear and to the hatred around us today, which is his love. So this morning, we're going to look at these three actions that the Spirit of God enables us to do. And if you notice in the bulletin, the title of my message is The Spirit of God. Perhaps more appropriately, the title of my message could be this morning, How Knowing the Spirit of God Enables Christians to Do These Actions that we're called to here in 1 John 4 this morning. So we're going to look at three actions that the Holy Spirit enables believers to do when we know the Spirit 
of God. So my message again is the Spirit of God, or knowing the Spirit of God. Let's look at verse 1 of 1 John chapter 4. Um, I did begin the series here in 1 John in the evening services on Zoom. If you were able to join us for those, they are posted on uh, YouTube as well. I invite you to go back and, 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 and review those if you've missed them. And of course, I began also at the same time a series in Jeremiah. Last week, I paused both series for Memorial Day weekend. And I'm keeping the Jeremiah series paused for now and picking up with 1 John. And I plan to return to 1 John tonight as well. I invite you to join us, whether by Zoom or in person, for the evening service tonight in 1 John as well. But 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. Again, my message is the spirit of God. Are, is the spirit, there are different spirits in the world today. Is the spirit of God or not of God? That is a great question to ask. Whenever we face um, a controversy, a conflict, a uh, question of what we should do, what we should, how we should react, how we should respond, what we should say, what we should believe, let's try, let's test, in other words, the spirit, is it of God or of the world? Believe not every spirit, but try, test the spirit, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. And of course, their spirit is not the spirit of God. So these false prophets, these false teachers, are people who are teaching something that is not from the Holy Spirit. Something that God did not intend to be taught as his truth. His truth is inspired in the word of God. The Bible is inspired by God's Holy Spirit. If it's of the Bible, if it's of God's word, if it's consistent with God's word, not just based, not just springing from God's word and, and going in a man's opinion, but is it consistent? With what God teaches in his word, the entire word of God, not pulling one verse here or one verse there, but entire, the entire word of God is consistent. Then God's spirit is consistent with, with that teaching. Um, if not, it may be that of a false prophet, many of which have gone into the world, even in John's day. But now, of course, you can multi multiply that many times since John's day. That there are false prophets that have gone out into the world. Verse 2, hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. So, with, in other words, anyone who is a believer, anyone who is a Christian, vital for our faith is the belief, the confession of Christ's incarnation, that he was born of a virgin, that Jesus Christ was not just a man, he is the Son of God. He was fully man and fully God. That is vital to Christianity. You know, there are denominations perhaps today that would might teach otherwise, or, or preachers today, or teachers that might teach otherwise, but those are false teaching. And false professions of faith if they deny that Jesus is God's son. If they deny that Jesus was fully man, fully God, that he was born of a virgin. Those are vital to our faith. Hereby know we the, ye the spirit of God. We know the spirit of God. We can recognize the spirit of God in someone if they are confessing that yes, Jesus is God's son. That yes, Jesus was born of a virgin. That yes, Jesus was fully man and fully God. If, if they are confessing that, you can recognize as they have the Holy Spirit. That's a true believer if he believes these things. That Jesus Christ has come in the flesh and is of God. Every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. That was one of the false teachings that John was encountering in his day. This idea of Gnosticism that you know flesh is bad and, and, and the spirit is, 
is good and they would take it to two extremes, either to indulge their flesh because it didn't matter, it's of this world, it's going to pass away, or to completely deny their flesh of everything, even you know, the necessary food and, and starve themselves of, of good things sometimes for the sake of the spirit. The two different uh, extremes there and the idea behind it was Jesus was not really a man, he was just a, a spirit being who took on the form of a man, like we see in the Old Testament, God taking the form of a man. But John is saying, no, he really came in the flesh. He was born by the Virgin, Mary. He was God's son. He never sinned. And he suffered on the cross in our place as a man and as God. And because he was a man who never broke the law, he didn't have to die. So he's a substitute for us at the cross. And because he's God, who became flesh, who became man, his life counts for an infinite number of human lives in taking the punishment for our sin. And that's very important. And, and the spirit of Antichrist, mentioned here in the next verse here, against Christ, or instead of Christ, is that of denying that Jesus has come in the flesh, that Jesus is not a, a man and not the Son of God. Uh, verse 3, And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God, and this is the spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. So the spirit of Antichrist is in the world today, not just of the Antichrist who's going to rule the world during the uh, tribulation period, but the general spirit that is against or instead of in place of the true Jesus Christ and representing a false version of Christ. And again, how do we know? How do we test? How do we detect whether the version of Jesus Christ is de being depicted? And you have many different depictions that are false today, whether it's uh, Hollywood depictions of Jesus and who Jesus is or our cultural depictions of who Jesus is, or personal you know, professions of faith and believing something about Jesus that's not true. You know, that Jesus was only of love, that Jesus would never condemn sin because he's, he's, he's all loving and all forgiving and, and he would never send anyone to hell. Now it's a false version of Christ. It's a false picture of Christ. The truth of who Jesus is is revealed in Scripture by the Holy Spirit, the inspiration of God's Word. And so we need to test the spirits. Is this of God or is it a false teaching? Is it an uh, error about Christ? Verse 4, ye are of God, little children. And this is where we come to the second, second point. But before we go all the way into that, I would like us to drop down to verse 6, continuing the idea of rejecting false teachings. That's the first action that the Holy Spirit enables Christians to do is to reject false teachings, especially that the false teaching that Jesus was not fully man or not the Son of God. But look at verse 6 as well. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So if it is the spirit of God, if we can test the spirit and see whether it is of God, then we can discern between what is true and what is false. What is consistent with God's word and what is an error. You know, for example, very uh, appropriate to our time today, I have heard it said by, by you know, many Christians, oh, we must submit to the government. That means we need to keep our church closed. Well, that means in California, they can't reopen their church indefinitely because the governor in California says churches aren't allowed to open yet, uh, or at least not above a certain number. And so if the church opens above that number, then they're not submitting. Is that is that correct? Well, that means that churches in China, churches in Vietnam, churches in other countries like that, they're all in not submitting to their government. Is that correct? No. The government, when it says resist not the power in Romans 13 and submitting to every ordinance thereof, it's referring to not violently trying to, you know, trying to uh, resist that power that when they, you know, if the police were to come here, we wouldn't riot against the police like we saw in Minneapolis. We wouldn't do something like that to them and go down to the police department and break those windows. That kind of resistance we're not called to. 
But if we have to obey God rather than men, we should be ready to do so, even if it means being taken away in a patrol car and taken down and having to get a lawyer and, 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 and uh, make the case for our freedom. Um, being willing to stand uh, sometimes uh, will require, or even in China and uh, other countries like that, Christians sometimes have to meet in secret. Even at the time Romans 13 was written, which is where everyone takes the idea that well, we have to do whatever the government says. When the government says we can't open the church, we can't open the church. Well, were they allowed to open the church under the government at the time Romans 13 was written? No, it was illegal. They were meeting illegally then when that passage was written. So you can't say that. You can't say that that means that. Because we have a higher calling than that in Romans chapter 10, verse 24, which is to assemble to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. Don't we see the day approaching today? I think we can see the day approaching, that we don't know when the day is, but it's getting closer. And so, so much the more do we need to be gathering and not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. So much the more. And uh, so we are called to that. And we have to test these ideas about God's word when someone says, well, Bible says, submit to every ordinance, so don't resist the power of the government, keep your church closed. We can reject that as a false teaching based on what the rest of the scripture tells us. Um, so let's be careful, of course, how we do things. I mean, for a time we voluntarily did not assemble in this room. And we did it based on you know, the idea that oh, if we assemble, we're gonna have a, a mass outbreak. And certainly there's sometimes we can adjust what we do to keep safe and i think we're doing that even today with the social distancing right here in this room but we have to test the spirits what would god want us to do in this situation what is of god what is of the world let's distinguish between truth and error and uh you know even at times i could be wrong myself and uh Ultimately, you need to test everything by what does the Word of God say? What does the Spirit of God say? And uh, follow the Spirit of God. Discern between error and truth. And then down in verse uh, 15, notice uh, this is mentioned again, verse 15. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. Very key. To distinguishing between truth and error is knowing. Do we have the Spirit of God? Well, you have the Spirit of God if you're believing that Jesus is God's Son. If you are trusting God's Son for your salvation, what He did at the cross, the Holy Spirit dwells in us. We have the Spirit of God. Listen to the Holy Spirit illuminating God's Word to us. Don't go off and say, oh, uh, well, I believe God's telling me to do this, but only follow your heart and being influenced by the world make sure that our hearts and our minds are in the submission to the word of god and that the holy spirit is leading us through the word of god and then we can discern between truth and error that's the first uh, action uh, the holy spirit enables us we see the holy spirit enabling us in this passage the second action the holy spirit the spirit of god enables believers to do is to overcome the world. Look at verse 4. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And you know, um, sometimes I think there's too much emphasis put on the angels and demons and Satan, too much emphasis sometimes put on those. Even the verse about ministering spirits there in Hebrews 1, verse 14, I believe it is, in uh, Hebrews 1. Some, some people will, will emphasize, well, everyone has a guardian angel watching over them. That may be true. The Holy Spirit, the, the, the uh, angels are there to minister. But even more powerful than the angels around us, whether it's Satan's angels or God's angels, and we know that God's angels are much more powerful because their authority comes from God. Satan has a certain level of power that may be greater than our own physical human power, but not greater than God. And even greater than the angels, 
God's angels who are ministering spirits is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit dwells in every believer. So although there may be angels helping watch over us and protect us as well, we don't have to emphasize or focus on that. Remember, the Holy Spirit, if you are a believer, is in you. And the Holy Spirit can guide you and help protect you. And even through um, our prayers, the Holy Spirit works to intercede on our behalf, as we see in the following verses. And so we can overcome the world. Whatever challenge, whatever controversy um, lies before us, whatever we must face in this life, whatever difficulty, whether personal struggle or trial or temptation, the Holy Spirit is greater. The Holy Spirit in us, God's Spirit, is greater than he that is in the world. And again, the Holy Spirit helps us to distinguish. Is this something that is of the world? It's worldly or something that is of God? And that's very, very important. You know, today I, I fear that one of the reasons the church is facing such an issue today with local governments and state governments wanting to keep them closed is not just because of, you know, there being a spiritual struggle and there being unbelievers in high places, but also sometimes the church has brought in worldly methods of trying to reach the world with the gospel. And we need to be careful of that. We need to discern, test the spirits, make sure we're um, overcoming the world by the Holy Spirit, not trying to overcome the world with the world. Because today, when, when secular people in government, such as governors and county officials, look pragmatically around them and see churches with thousands of people that resemble a movie theater in the way they assemble or resemble a rock concert in the way that they worship or resemble a sporting event, they, it's easy for them to say, this is not essential, just like the sporting events, the movie theaters and the rock concerts. We're not having them meet, so why should the church meet? But I think if we were meeting the way our church does and worshiping and gathering and submitting to the Holy Spirit, testing the spirits and making sure we are overcoming the world by the Spirit of God, not by the world. I think there might be a little less objection, at least a little less tendency for the world to say, yes, you're non-essential. Because of the, some of it, I think, is brought on by some of, of, of the modern movement in Christianity and churches. And, and some of that, the, the teachings in those churches may be biblical. Some of those teachings, um, you know, the tele, on television and such, you have to test the spirit. It may be of the world. Are they telling you, believe Christ so that he can make this life better for you, so you can have wealth and prosperity and health, and you can feel better, and you can be, you know, psycho psychologically ha happier, I mean, that's not why we're called to follow Christ, to have a happier life. Ask Stephen. You know, ask Peter. Ask the apostles in the, in, the, in the early days of the church. Did they follow Christ to have a happier life? They may have been happier for it, yes. But they didn't follow him just so they could, you know, have um, mater more material, more physical happiness. I mean, there were those who wanted to follow Jesus for that reason, and Jesus rejected that when they wanted to force Jesus to be their king because he turned the, the five loaves and two fishes into a multitude left over with 12 baskets left over. There were those who forcibly wanted Jesus to be their king so they would never have to work again. They wouldn't have to get up early in the morning and bake the bread and go fishing because Jesus could just make it out of thin air for them. But that is a, that's a wrong motivation. And so we have to test the spirits. Is this of God or is this of the world? And when we are of God, when we are his children, we are following God and doing things his way. He overcomes the world for us. And we don't have to become fearful and overwhelmed by what we see going on in the world around us. Because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. But look at verse 5. Sometimes, you know, sometimes I believe false teachers, especially, I'm speaking of here, not true believers per se, gather a large following 
and teach something that is religious, teach something that they may say is, 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 is in the Bible, and they go off in a, in a diverse direction from what God would actually want them to with that, and they, but they collect a large following, make a lot of money on their book sellings and their you know, gifts and donations and such, because they're appealing with a worldly message. Look at verse five, they are of the world. Therefore, speak they of the world, and the world hears them. The world has a desire to hear certain things. And some preachers, some teachers, if they're not speaking of the Spirit of God and doing things God's way, they will have their hearing because the world wants to hear things of the world, and they speak things of the world. But verse 6 tells us, we are of God. Now, this, of course, is not to just develop this us versus them. We want to reach the world. Not set us up as, okay, this is us. We are, we are of God. They're of the world. So let's have nothing to do with them. No, we want to reach them with the spirit of God, with the gospel. But the point is, let's not use a worldly message or worldly methods to do it. Let's do it with the spirit of God, with God's word, with God's truth, with God's love. Verse 6, we are of God, he that knoweth God heareth, heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Again, going back to that first action, the Holy Spirit enables us to discern between truth and error. But he also enables us to overcome the world. The third action that the Holy Spirit enables us Believers enables Christians to do in the face of the fear, in the face of the hatred around us, is to love. To love, because God is love. Look at verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another. So specifically, what or who are we to love? We're to love one another. Notice here it's not saying the Holy Spirit enables us to love the world. We're called not to love the world. Now, God so loved the world. That's a different sense. We want to love the people and reach them with the spirit of truth, with the spirit of God. But the people we especially should have a love for naturally flowing out of God's spirit, the fruit of the spirit, love, are brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's, as, as Jim mentioned in his Sunday school this morning, what really should mark us as his church, as believers, is how we love one another. Jesus told his disciples that in John 13, that by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, by how ye love one another. That's how the world knows we all are his disciples. Not, when, not just by the pre preaching of the truth, which is very important, but by how we love one another. We all believe that Jesus is the Son of God. We should all love each other. We have that in common. That is our bond. And with that bond, there should be love. There will be love if we have that bond. That's what John tells us here in the rest of this passage. And he's already told us that in chapter 3, if you remember from a couple of weeks ago, that God gives us that love for one another. We can't say we love God and, and also hate our brother. It's, it's, we can't do that. If we truly love God, we will also love one another. So look at verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. A very, very specific, of course, the word love is not referring to, I mean, people love as in they love their family. They might love their job even. They might love certain activities, certain hobbies love their spouse. It's not talking about that kind of love, that kind of affection. Um, it, it's not a romantic love or a brotherly love that we're speaking of here. This is the, specifically the sacrificial, unconditional love that God loved us with. And it makes it very clear in the following verses what kind of love he's talking about when he says this is the kind of love that God showed to us by sending his only begotten son to die on the cross for us. That kind of love. That's the kind of love we're called to have for one another. A sacrificial, selfless, unselfish. There's not, we're not liking somebody because of what they say to us or what they do for us or what we might be able to get them to do for us. 
We love them for who they are and for what we can do for them, the way Jesus loved his disciples, giving his life for them, demonstrating it when he washed their feet, that he loved them, that he was serving them. This kind of love, agape love is the word here. Beloved, let us love one another for love is of God. Everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. Again, this all stems from verse two. Hereby know ye the spirit of God. If we know the spirit of God, we'll be able to discern between truth and error. We'll be able to overcome the world and we will be able to love one another in the family of God. Verse eight, he that loveth not knoweth not God for God is love. And that, of course, has been twisted sometimes in presenting a, a bit of a false version, a very false version of God and saying, well, God is only of, of love. He's not also holy and just, but no, he's both. He loves us, yes, but that love is not enough in of itself to get us to heaven. If it was, Jesus would not have had to die on the cross because he would have loved us so much that he would just let everyone into heaven. And some people would like to believe that. It would be nice if that were the case, but God, but, but, it, it would, but then that would not be nice in the sense that then there'd be no justice. Then anything that is done evil in this world would not be paid for. But Jesus loved us so much, he made a way for all sins to be paid for, effective to those who believe. Because some people don't love God after he first loved us. They reject him. And in the end, get what they want, which is separation from God. And unfortunately, and it's, it's a very sad and, and uh, terrible punishment that awaits them in the lake of fire one day. But look at verse number verse number nine. In this was manifested the love of God toward us. So we know God's love. It's demonstrated for us. It's manifested toward us because God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Again, not just referring to this life and, and, and improving this life, but that we might have true life, spiritual life, because without God, we're already condemned. We're already spiritually dead. But with Christ, we have life. We have, um, we're freed from the separation from God that would last even beyond this life into eternity. But we have life through Jesus Christ, not only in this world, but forever with God through his son. If we have placed our trust, if we know God, if we place our trust in his son and what he has done for us, because God sent his son, only begotten son, verse nine, into the world that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we loved God. God didn't love us because we loved him first. We love him because he loved us first. So actually a little bit of selfishness on our part. We, we, we don't love God for nothing. We love him because he loved us. But God demonstrated his love. And that's the kind of love we should have for people, especially brothers and sisters in Christ. Is We're not loving them because they loved us first. Because that's what God did for us. He loved us before we loved him. And that's the way we should love other people. Love them before they ever treat us with anything like love or if they never treat us with love and God loves the world he loves everyone unfortunately all, all those who reject his love that that's their choice but that doesn't negate the fact that he loved them and he demonstrated that if they're willing to see it at the cross if they're willing to believe it at the cross by his son dying in our place here in his love not that we loved him, god but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation in other words a payment a substitution for our sins beloved if god so loved us we ought also to love one another no man has seen god at any time if we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. And again, just to mention Hebrews 10 one more time, 
why is it we gather? Why is it we gather here together today? It's because we love one another. Hebrews 10 also makes that clear when it calls us to physically gather together, to assemble, to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Hebrews 10, 24 says, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. You see the reason we gather, the reason we assemble is because we love one another. And as I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, when we love someone, we want to spend time with them. You know, if you love your spouse, you want to spend time with them. You know, before you dated your spouse, you wanted to spend time with that special person. And, and, and with your family, if you love your family, you want to spend time with them. You want to visit them. You want to see them. And the same with us as a family of God. If we love one another, as God says, if we have his spirit, we will. We will love our brother. Then we'll want to spend time with each other. We'll want to see each other. We'll want to assemble together so that we can encourage one another, so we can provoke each other to good works. You know, I can try to do that over Zoom through a message, but you all have a part to play in provoking one another into love and good works just by coming together and visiting with another and listening to the same message and singing the same songs together and seeing each other on a weekly basis. We're called to that love. We're enabled to love each other by the Spirit of God. Verse 13, Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us, because he hath given us his Spirit. That's how we know that we're, we, we are in Christ, that we're a child of God, because his Spirit is in us. And we can see that manifested by the love, which is one of the fruits of the Spirit. The Spirit of God enables us to love one another. Verse 14, And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. It's the second time we're told in this passage. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. You know, sometimes we hear God is love and we all know God is love. How do we know that? We know because God's the spirit revealed it to us in scripture, outside of scripture, you know, in foreign countries where um, they do terrible things uh, such as in, 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 in pagan times, you know, sacrificing babies to their idol. Did they know God is love? No, their God was not love because their God is not the true God. We know God is love. We know it through God's spirit revealing that in his word. And if we truly know that, then what goes with it is our love for one another. If we have God in us, we have love in us because God is love. If we don't have love in us, there's, there's, a, there's a warning sign there. Do we have God in us? Do we have the spirit of God in us? Because God is love. If we have no love in us, if we have no love for one another, for God's people, for others who confess that Jesus has come in the flesh and died for our sins, that Jesus was sent by God to be the Savior of the world. If we don't love other people who believe that, then where is God in us? Where is the love? Because God is love. That love needs to be in us. It will be in us if we truly have the Spirit of God in us. Herein is our love made perfect. In other words, our love, when, when we accept Christ, we're not perfect. We need to grow. We need to mature. We need to be made complete. We grow in the love that the Holy Spirit brings when he comes into our heart. The love for brothers and sisters in Christ. We grow in that and the other fruits of the Spirit as well. Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. You see, we become more bold because of love in our hearts. You know, that's, that's, that's a key to sharing our faith, to witnessing to someone, whether it's giving a track, whether it's sharing our testimony, trying to win a soul to God, to Christ. If we love, if we have love in our hearts, we have that same love that God 
had when he loved the world and gave his son to die on the cross. If we have that love in our heart, it will overflow naturally into wanting people to be saved because that's what God wants. That's what his love wants. If we have that love in our heart, we want to see people reached with the gospel, with the good news. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness. So the love in our heart will give us a boldness to share that love with others, to share the gospel, to share in ways that we can also demonstrate our love to other people. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in the world. You know, if we have the love of Christ in our life, on the day that we stand before God one day, rather than being ashamed of how we lived our life, we'll have a certain boldness because the love of God will have produced fruit in our life. For however long we knew Christ, that we were growing in that love, walking in that love, and, and serving God at one day we can stand and face him and with joy look forward to that day because as he is so are we in the world the way that Jesus was in the world and remember Jesus warned his disciples if they have hated me if they have persecuted me if I have suffered you can expect all of these things persecution suffering hatred from the world because that's how Jesus was treated we don't expect to be treated any better but just as Jesus was the light of the world we are called to be the light and to point people to christ she said jesus pointed men to his father and drew people to himself to god for salvation we should be doing through god through his spirit through love there is no fear in love but perfect love casts out fear because fear hath torment he that feareth is not made perfect in love. You know, the answer to the fear that we see around us, you know, the fear of what's going to happen in the 2020 elections, what's going to happen with the pandemic, what's going to happen with the police and with the anarchy in our society today in certain parts of the country in particular. We don't have to be afraid of that. We don't have to have torment of fear. If we have God's love being completed, being perfected, growing in us, that we would be able to demonstrate that love that Jesus demonstrated for us at the cross to other people and love them. And of course, love God. Look at verse 19. We love him. We love Jesus because he first loved us. We love God. We love Jesus because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God and hate his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this is the commandment that we have from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. So we should love one another because we have God in us and God is love, and we should love doubly so because not only do we have God who is love in our hearts, but we also have a command from God to love one another. You know, we, in this time that we live now, and with the unrest that we've seen this week up in Minneapolis, with the, you know, perhaps unrest other places that, due to the shutdowns and the economic concerns, the political controversies, all of these things, we have the ability to discern between truth and error because of Spirit of God in us. We have the ability to overcome the world because of the Spirit of God in us being greater than he that is in the world, greater than the devil, greater than the world. And finally, we have love. We have the ability to love. We are enabled to love by the Spirit of God in us. Let us allow ourselves to take all of these actions, discerning between what is right and wrong, with what is true and untrue, overcoming the world, and loving one another through the Spirit of God 
in us. And you know, I love that song. It's just like his great love. Before we close in prayer, would you join us in, in singing the song? And again, if you would this, this week, just go ahead and leave your hymnal in your pew afterwards so we can sanitize that area uh, afterward. But if you would join us in singing this hymn, 494, Dan, would you come and lead that hymn? And then we'll close in, in prayer. Pastor's message this morning uh, seems to go along with some things Jim said. But you know, one of the greatest obstacles uh, to uh, to being obedient to Christ and, and loving one another, biggest obstacle to me. It's me. Same thing like in marriage and family relationships. The thing that, that keeps you from really loving the other person is yourself. You know, when you really love someone else, you want what's best for them. You want to see them succeed. Uh, you don't want to see bad things happen to them. And uh, if we could just kind of get that through our head, that especially when, when you disagree with someone else, instead of <clears throat> wishing ill of them or really having trouble loving them to think, you know, what did God do in my behalf? Did he love me because I was so good? Because I did everything right? No, he loved me because he saw what I could be. He saw things that I could succeed in. And that's what he wanted from me. He wanted the best for me. So uh, let's let's sing this song together. And, and you know, as, as this week goes by, and, and you're going to run into people that you really don't love. You think about that. How can how can I have Christ's love for this person? And be like him. Let's sing uh, 494. First and last. tonight at, at 6 p.m. and then Wednesday we have a prayer meeting at 6.30 we have a WANA. Uh, you know, if you're um, 
If you are 65 or older, I invite you to come to the prayer meeting. If you're younger than that, I invite you to help me with the one clubs. Uh, I know the CDC is recommending that you know, right now uh, people 65 and older not work with uh, the children in the children's ministries. And so we understand that concern. And uh, it's actually for that reason that uh, they had some openings, extra openings in the Calvary summer camps that they're going to have. And I'll, I'll get to, uh, to, to serve in that this summer, Lord willing. And uh, also remember God hears us because we have the Holy Spirit in us, helping us to pray. And sometimes the Holy Spirit helps us to pray for things we don't even uh, think to pray for and help us in that moment that we need that help. And please thank you for those who pray for me on a daily basis. I know I'm on the prayer list every week. And yesterday uh, we had a close call. We had a near-death experience with JL and uh, that she uh, was on the the jungle trim out here, um, and she was wearing her bike helmet, and she went through the bars on the jungle trim and let go, and her bike helmet caught and stayed buckled. And uh, fortunately, Julia was there, and Jackie was close enough where she could run and go and lift her up, and get. And Ju Julia had to reach down and, and unbuckle it for her, but uh, she was actually starting to accidentally hang, uh, strangle, and so. Um, very thankful, you know, you appreciate life so much more when it's almost taken away. It's just like, it shocks you a little bit and kind of scares you. But then you remember, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And you know the devil would love to bring that kind of suffering. We remember that God is good, God is loving. And sometimes things like that do happen, even to believers. But God will go with us all the way. The Holy Spirit, God's Spirit is in us. And he's greater than he is in, that is in the world. He helps us to see the difference between truth and error. He helps us to overcome the world. He enables us to love one another. Let's, let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for, um, for everyone who's joined us by Zoom, for everyone who's joined us in, in person this morning. And Lord, we just pray that you would uh, bless this day for everyone who has joined us this morning and that many will be able to join us again tonight, whether by Zoom or in person tonight, for another message in, in First John. And Lord, we just pray that we would um, submit to your Holy Spirit every day, that we would try the spirits around us and even in ourselves, things that we might say, that we ask ourselves, is this of God's Spirit? Before we say it, before we even think it, before we listen to something, before we believe something, is this of God? Is this of God's Spirit? Is this of the devil is of the world. I pray that we would do that and discern between truth and error. I pray that we would remember that we have your Holy Spirit in us. And if we truly have your Holy Spirit in us, we have one who is greater in us than he was in the world. And you overcome this world for us. We thank you for the demonstration of your love at the cross for us, for your son giving his life for us at the Pray that we would lay down our lives for you each day and for one another as we would demonstrate your love to this world and especially to one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, I pray you bless the rest of this day now, this uh, any time of fellowship as we uh, walk out and, and uh, bless the rest of this day and of this week now. We ask in Jesus' name we commit it to you for your glory. Amen.